we have Jeffrey Cook. We are back in the session. Part of the council of president, part of the council of our jury, and our president. Our president witnesses have on the witness stand, and uh, people may cross the stand. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon again. Excellent. Oh, there was one. There was one other question my colleague asked today. Just clarify, make sure she said. Okay. Um, when you mentioned the peaks that we saw that were not allele, yes, is that still potential DNA that could be there? Yes. Okay. That was my last question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Proceed. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, the nanogram is one billionth of a gram. Yes. We just verified that. Okay. And the picogram is thousand thousandth of a nanogram. Yes. There's about six picograms approximately per cell, depending on the type of cell. Depending on the cell, depending on the donor's okay. so your status. Donor status. And your quantifications, most of them, you fair to say, were under 0 0.001 of a nanogram. Correct. Per microliter. Which is 1,000 of a nanogram per microliter. Right. In the one microliter. On a very, very small amount of Mm -hmm. yes. yes. We have a total of 48 microliters uh, after quantitation. So if you... So what you do is you take that quant value and you multiply that by 48, and that's where we stand for our concentration. Okay. And all but... Well, let me ask you this. How many of those items can take many <laughs> Four had uh, inconclusive results for male DNA. Were there any that had conclusive results that had? Were you just test with counsel? For male DNA, no. At the, quantifi at the quantification stage, no. So your results did have male DNA, though, or indicated male DNA? Correct. How do you explain that? Uh, well, our quantification is a estimate. Um, this is just helping us, allowing us to target appropriately in our amplification. So the quantification for male DNA doesn't necessarily mean it's there. Correct. It's an estimation tool used, um, and our system has its limits of detection. Because we saw male DNA, or indications of male DNA with the Y allele and the 2 at Y and L, um, that allows us to say that male DNA was present. I'm going to show you, I kind of did what counsel did, but I just want to clarify some points. Um, so I'll move quickly through those points. If I can have whatever attorney number this is, please. So the white electrical cord, uh, item E15, which was your item E1, just so we keep it straight, you have no results from that. Correct. So you can't tell whether it was a mixture, you can't tell whether uh, it was single source, you can't draw any conclusions whatsoever. Correct. And we saw the EPGs or electropharograms from that, and I want to show you a little bit closer. The electropharogram. I'll back out so you can see. I'm talking about the same item. So here's the item number E01A1. Is that right? Yes. As we move along here, and this is kind of in follow-up to Council's last question, you'd be looking at a particular location, you'd be looking for some kind of indication of DNA at D16S539, for example. And I'm moving my, my hand across there. Correct. And down here would be where the results would be, or where you would look to see if there were any results. Correct. Many peaks. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what what is this? What are we looking at here? Uh, that that's a, our baseline. What does that mean? Our instrumentation has to be continuously detecting, looking for those relative uh, <laughs> fluorescence off of our DNA. Uh, because it's continuously detecting, it has to have a baseline. And once it detects DNA, we get the peak, the electropharogram. Depending on how much uh, DNA we're seeing, we get a peak once it comes past the camera in our instrumentation. So it goes past the camera, if it's present, we get an excitement of fluorescence, and it, that generates a peak in our software. 
And if it's not present, there's still some what we call noise, right? Fine noise, yes. Or background noise. Mm -hmm. If it comes forward, yes? Yes. Okay. And do you know any way that you can derive a profile just based on baseline noise? From baseline noise, no. Um, that's why it's called baseline noise. And you know it's baseline noise because your particular lab sets what has validation sets, right? Correct. And those validation studies set a certain threshold. Correct. So our analytical and stochastic threshold that we spoke about earlier are what my lab has set in use for this particular kit. And the reason they have that is because they want you to be confident that you're looking at actual alleles. Correct. That the data that we're associating to alleles um, is strong enough and significant enough to do so. And you're not looking at the noise the machine makes as it's running. Correct. And that's why when I ask you the question if you can if you can derive data from that, or if you know of any way you can derive data from that, um, your lab has a particular value and that value is there for a reason. Yes. on the um, undergarments, item A2, based on your thresholds, you got no results. Correct. No results. No DNA profile obtained from this item of evidence. Okay. Now, you were asked a question earlier about whether you could do a comparison. I want to make clear, I'm not asking you to do a comparison. Okay. Uh, what I want to do is take us through what you would do if you were to do a comparison. If you were to have enough information and enough data uh, to do a comparison. Objection to relevance, that's not a question. 352. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is item A3, and I believe you labeled it item E03. Correct. Okay, and the results there on the left, with your case number, and then it begins with 14. Yes. Okay, 14 and then a dash, which represents other possible means. Correct. Could be more than one. Correct. And if there was more than one allele there, that would indicate a mixture. Correct. Okay. So let's assume, and I know you don't have it, and I'm not asking you to, but let's assume there was another word that allele. Well, Your Honor, that's a hypothetical based on uh, no evidence, so the improper hypothetical. Would you compare a number here with the number on an own set? If the profile developed is determined to be suitable for comparisons, yes. If it was suitable for comparison, you would compare the number on the question sample, the results you got, with a known sample. And I have an example of a known, three known samples there to the right of that. Correct, okay. if that profile is deemed suitable. Okay. Now, the two people here named Joseph and Summer, if we were to assume they had children, I see that Joseph, for instance, at that location is a 15, 17, and Summer's a 15, it looks like. Your Honor, I'd object to this line of question. It's totally irrelevant because the sample he wants to compare, not compare it. I'm not comparing the sample. Then there's no relevance to this line of question. Well, we talked about children inheriting one from the parent and one from the child. Or one from the mother, one from the father. Yes. Okay. So the children of those two people would have some combination of their own. That's correct. Sweatpants, item A1, your item E4, no results. Correct. <laughs> Leach can degrade DNA, can't it? Yes. We use it to clean our lab benches, followed by a wash of ethanol. That's how we sterilize our <laughs> utensils. Thank you. Don't <laughs> me. 
Here under D16-539, this location, you see two small peaks. Yes. Those, those were below your analytical threshold. That's correct. And to the left of that, pretty flat, right? Yes, for the printed EPG, yes, that's pretty flat. Um, when we print the EPGs, the scaling can be different, um, but baseline is always there. Okay. Let's look at D21 here. You see that? Yes. So this is item E3A1, D21. Now, there is a way you mentioned it, but nobody asked you about it. You mentioned the term lab. Yes. Okay. When you look at this digitally, along with the digital files will come also a ladder file. A ladder is run with the samples, so we have a ladder specific to the tray that the sample is run on. Okay. So the tray the samples run on has a ladder, and I'll show you what that is in a minute. Mm -hmm. And it's specific to that particular tray in this machine. Correct. Okay. Are you aware of any software that will manipulate or change the ladders? No. Because the ladders are specific to that data. The ladder is uh, manufactured, is commercially manufactured and sold with the amplification kit and the CE kits that we use. Um, so there's no manipulation of the ladder aside from adding it to the well um, on the same tray as the sample. Now, on item E3, this is just an example, that location D21S11, did you call any alleles? There are no alleles to call here uh, because there's nothing above analytical threshold. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like there's much of anything there, right? Right. Okay. Um, so when I say call, I mean you're making the determination that's above your threshold, and you can confidently say based on your equipment, there's an allele there. Yes, that there has been amplification of DNA at that particular location. reached our analytical threshold. Right. So we call 27, 28, 29, 30, 30.2, 31, 31.2, 32, 32.2, 33.2, 34.2, and 35, right? Correct. Nothing reached our analytical threshold. Gotcha. But when you are looking, let's say something had, when we talk about ladders, this is this discoloration pink and gray, that would be an indication of a ladder, right? The gray is a visualization help. Um, there have been specific to uh, different allele calls. Uh, this helps the analysis, analysis uh, during um, data interpretation of the data to help them visualize potential peaks or alleles. Okay. And what you're looking for is a peak here. Let's say this is the bin 30 bin. You're looking for a peak here that's in the middle of the bin, in this gray area. We're looking for it to size correctly and be above our thresholds. Okay. And for the peak to be in, in the bin. Correct. Okay. Yeah, um, more they, than one, one peak in a bin, you don't call that, right? If it's above your analytical threshold. It depends on how it looks. It could be a split peak um, due to very close allele calls. And if, if the peak's off to the side of the bin, like this peak here, 
If that was at an analytical threshold, it'd be called if it's in the bin. Okay. How about all of this down here? <coughs> That's what we just, the baseline background noise that we talked about. is a separate uh, sample, is in a sample, separate well, so it's its own sample that's being analyzed. Um, those gray bins are just virtual, um, virtual bins for locations without having to pull up the ladder right next to the sample. And your honor, for the record, exhibit 1013, since no foundation was set for it, we move to strike it and strike testimony about it. Same thing for 1011, unless foundation is laid for what it actually shows. Do both of the, the items I've shown you, the close-ups, appear to be close-ups of the electropharograms that, on the samples that we discussed? Yes. Okay. And in fact, at this location, we did call a 14. And if we assume that the bin here, the gray bin, is 14, because the one to the right of it is 15, there's a peak there, right? Correct. And over here to the left, on the y-axis, would be the RFUs. Correct. Would be above 125, would be about this location, and you called that confidently, that's an allele. Yes, it, if it reaches our analytical threshold, we assign it the allele hall. Okay, and over to the right, where it says 19.2, that's probably that bacterial? That is that bacterial on that. Okay, that's it. 666 RFUs? Yes. Okay. Now, you didn't make calls at 16, 16.2, 17, or 18 because they didn't rise your analytical pressure. Correct. And you can't distinguish them uh, from noise. Correct. And that's the noise that the machine makes. The background. Background noise. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So we have a peak detection uh, along with our background noise. Uh, we have a peak detection threshold when we're starting to see peaks come above the background noise, but we can't be confident um, until we've reached the analytical threshold. And one more location on item E3, D12S391. Is there a D12S391? Yes, it's in the purple channel. Purple channel. Ah, okay, here we go. So then we're looking at the, at the EPG earlier. Did you call any alleles at that location? No alleles are called at this location because they don't reach the uh, analytical threshold. And again, what we're looking at here below there is background noise. Baseline background noise, yes. And I'm going to show you closer than that. <coughs> Does that appear to be a close up of that uh, location? And again, same objection, Your Honor. There's no foundation for any of these Does that appear to be a uh, close up of 
item E3 at that location? Yes. Okay. You, you didn't call any alleles at this location? Correct. No alleles, no peaks reached our in a local dry shovel. Okay. That is exhibit 1012. So in this bin where it says it's labeled bin for 18 allele, you see down there there's, there's two peaks. You see that? Yes, I see background noise. I see background noise, right. Okay. You didn't call 15, 18, or 20. Correct. I can't them. confirm any of those uh, bin locations. Um, and those peaks don't meet your analytical threshold. We talked about the sweats. Let's move on to the uh, E5, the white cord. I didn't want to back up. I'm sorry. Slide three on my exhibit. Back to item A3, A3A, and E03. Again, I'm not asking you to make a, I'm not asking you to make a comparison, but when you do, not all kits have the same locations. Correct. So, in other words, on this particular example, we assume the ones on the right are known samples at. Um, at D22S105, you got an 11, call it an 11, but there's nothing to compare it to in the known samples. If those are known samples. Governor, again, this whole line of questioning is inappropriate and irrelevant since you can't make any comparisons. So for D22, we can't make any comparisons, so we wouldn't compare them to any references. Okay, but if the reference didn't have, some references might not have. Right. That's what I'm getting at. So sometimes you don't have that location to Right. So the workflow is to, one, produce the DNA profile, determine if it's a mixture or single source, and determine if it's suitable for comparisons. If it doesn't make it past the suitable for comparison steps, it would never be compared to references based on our SOP. Uh, moving on to E5, your E5. RE11, that's the white cord. You've changed results at one, two, three, four locations. Correct. Okay. Another one at D22, but if, if, if that location is available on the known samples, you can't compare it, right? Assuming you had a, a profile you could compare. Assuming this profile was suitable for comparisons yes. and the reference didn't have D22 location, we would not be able to make comparisons. And moving on, item E6, your item E6, three pieces of red strap, you didn't get any of right. Why don't you just say the FBI population statistics say it's more likely that these alleles are going to be We're going to go ahead and say that they're there. I'm sorry? Well, the FBI population statistics, they have statistics as how many frequency of alleles in the population. That's correct. That's how we do our comparisons now, stats. Yeah. Why don't you just say, well, it's more likely, you know, it's more frequent in the population of persons of 13. So I'm just going to say it's 13. Well, one, it's ethically wrong. Um, and two, it's against our SOPs to make up DNA profiles. So if you don't have good data, you can't just make up a profile. Correct. Okay. You can't just plug in numbers into a little table and make comparisons. Thank you. Uh, item 825, your item E08. One, two, three, four results. Yes. Okay. Four locations. Again, your Honor, counsel keeps putting up tables as if he's trying to compare it with the jury, and this is totally inappropriate. There's no foundation. For I'm it. sorry, Your Honor. Comments like this are inappropriate. There's a request to size while we can. The objection sustained. Almost back. Partial profile. Yes. And it's a mixture. 
That's correct. And you said that you couldn't um, couldn't find a major contributor. Correct. We could not deduce out any um, major contributor from this profile. The parentheses here, according to your legend on your results, show that, that those are minor minor alleles. Correct. Um, that minor allele is indicative that the allele that's called is simply less than 60% of the parent peak. Okay, explain, can you explain that for me? Parent peak. So the parent peak, what we refer to as the parent peak, is the tallest peak at a particular location. If another allele is present at that location and it's less than 60% of the parent peak, it's designated as a minor allele. The minors are not specific to one individual in a sample of, of such of this. Okay, what do you mean it's not specific to one individual such as this? So we've called this mixture a partial DNA profile mixture consistent with two individuals. Um, if we were to say that the minors were consistent with one individual, obviously, based on looking at the profile, we know that to be incorrect. And two, if you look at the first location, we have three minor alleles. I've already told you that one contributor would have one, a max of two um, at their location, if it was a single source profile. Let's go back to the electrophorogram. So we're looking at the Two locations, or you talk called two alleles for above your analytical threshold. That's correct. Um, and at, at 17, now there were 17 repeats of that particular. Um, that SDR, yes. Yeah, that SDR, mm -hmm. 23 repeats there. And I'm going to show you exhibit number 1015. Same objection, my foundation. Here to be a close up of that same allele from that same sample. E2S 1338 from item E09. Yes, but it appears to be uh, reanalyzed. Well, if you ignore the, the writing here. Oh, well, yeah, not even the writing, but the color coding at the top. The color coding at the top. That means that someone else has looked at the raw data. Okay. But these gray uh, things would still be the bins, right? The virtual bins, yes. So someone else has plugged in the data, the color changed, and otherwise it's consistent with that allele. Oh, no, at that location, there's a 17 and a 23 that calls. And sorry, the gray are actual bins, the light pink are the virtual bins. And what's a virtual bin? A virtual bin, so we have a ladder that we're comparing our alleles, uh, our DNA fragments to, in order to size them. That ladder contains alleles that are common in the population. Um, like if we see a, like he explained, 13 so many times at this location, or 15. They'll put that in the ladder so that it's easier to size that DNA fragment. There are some alleles that are microvariants, or they're rare. They can't put all possible combinations in the ladder. We'd never be able to run the data appropriately. 
So the virtual bins are based on base pair size. So there is no specific uh, ladder peak for the pink virtual bins, but we know based on base pair size, that's where this particular pick would be. And then over to the left on the y axis, this represents 14 RFUs. Yes. Which would be, well, right around at least the top of background noise, right? Yes, yeah, so that's below our analytical threshold and our peak detection threshold. And if you go right down here to around five, that's just a lot of noise, isn't it? Baseline noise, background. Let me show you exhibit number. change it just means that someone else has looked at the data and manipulated the data. Okay. And you call it 18 here. This appear to be uh, close up, uh, a little bit down the line, 19. Yes, this is D12 with the 18 a little column. Correct. D12, S3. And again, when you get down here, about 14 or so, or even, we'll go down to 5. That's just noise. Yes. You can't tell whether that's the machine or that's actually being an material. Correct. It's indistinguishable from baseline. But what if, you know, 50% of the population is a 20 at that location? Can't you just call it 20? We cannot. And finally. S433 at that location, you called three alleles. Correct. Now, is you call a 13, a 14, and a 15, which would indicate a mixture? Yes. Who puts these boxes in? Uh, the software actually puts the um, initial allele calls in. When we're analyzing, we're going back in and verifying that we agree with the call and therefore calling the allele. Um, like I showed you that bacterial artifact that we kept seeing in multiple, that uh, peak actually had a box under it as well. But when I go in as the analyst to verify, and I show that it's not true with reprocessing and reloads, I delete that box. Um, so the, the software is putting the box in, I'm verifying that the box is correct. And show you the last one, exhibit 1017. Objection. That appear to be a uh, close-up with, with the bins included of D19 X433. Yes. And what little did you call again at this location? At this location, 13, 14, and 15. Okay. And does this appear to be down the chain from that? That same allele? I'm sorry? Does this appear, appear to be down the chain a little bit from that same allele, close up of that same location? A close up of the same location, yes. Okay. And down here around five again, just background. Background noise. Yes, uh, when a case is submitted, um, the casework supervisor, before assigning the case, will work out a test plan and uh, question the client if they want potential CODIS entry. 
If so, we have to get pre-approval from another lab because as a private lab, we don't have access to CODIS. But we can generate data that can end up in CODIS. And, and that's because the lab that you work with that does have CODIS access, has been your lab examines. They either come to the lab to audit the lab to make sure uh, our standards um, are appropriate and in line with their standards, as well as um, additional follow-up visits. You made that same request in this case. Same question. Uh, CODIS, I'm not sure if CODIS was requested in this case. I can verify. So it appears CODIS was initially uh, requested. Um, before we can start a case, if the client wants potential CODIS upload, we must have approval before touching the items of evidence in the lab. Um, but they decided to forego the CODIS upload to begin processing on the items of evidence. Is there any way you're aware of to distinguish between background noise and actual call? Uh, when you look down in the background noise, now, that we use our thresholds, so our analytical threshold and our stochastic threshold, um, as well as our peak detection. But distinguishing between baseline noise and trying to find a real peak at that level, um, we're unable to do that. to CODIS. Um, when the case comes in, my supervisor would have reached out to the client because it looks like on the submission form uh, the CODIS request box wasn't checked. So she reached out to confirm if code, they wanted CODIS, potential CODIS upload. Um, the client decided to forego CODIS upload, which allowed us to start the test um, in a quicker manner. And that was before you had any results? Yes. So we have to obtain that approval prior um, to any processing on the case. been able to upload it regardless um, as a private lab. After processing? Uh, no, we have to have approval prior to beginning processing on items of evidence. No, we don't. We can have partial profiles. Um, we don't determine suitability for CODIS upload. Um, we submit the data to wherever the client would like the data to go. Oh, wait, wait, no, I do have a couple. <laughs> What's your, you were asking questions about degradation of the DNA. Uh, yes. Based on the scenario here. Um, and the profiles developed. And the profiles developed. Mm -hmm. How long were these items in the ground? There's no way to tell that. If I could tell that, I wouldn't be right here. So you weren't given the information as to how long the items Correct. So you can't say that with confidence that saw we can't determine when the evidence is placed on the item or how and did you, did you so you don't know how long in other words you get the samples you don't know how long ago prior to you getting the samples they were actually recovered correct you have no idea we have no uh, no information regarding that I assume you have some regret. Just a little bit. Not much. I okay. prefer. But then I'm sure Mr. Dory's going to have just a little bit I may not. of redirect. I actually, I mean, you'll have just a little bit. <laughs> 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 I 
Yeah. I, I would prefer to try and finish with this witness today only because I never traveled. Yes, I'm leaving tomorrow. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> no. I'll be on that plane. <laughs> Unless you're going to apply and pick up my kid. I'll be yeah, very brief, I promise. All right. Uh, now, all the values for the analytical threshold and all the threshold you talked about, those are all for manual interpretation. Those are, that's for the data generated in our lab. So those numbers are based on our internal validations and the data that we saw throughout those validations. And the questions about whether or not you can distinguish between you know, noise and peaks, that's all something that's not really what you do as a, uh, an analyst at Bodhi with this type of information. Correct, we are looking at, um, we're looking at the profile as a total um, but we're looking at data that we can um, analyze and compare to. We're not scrutinizing the baseline, um, trying to pick out peaks um, in a situation like this. If there was an instance of contamination where we were trying to look for potential uh, comparisons, even at that low level, we wouldn't be able to distinguish the baseline from noise. And questions about uploading the CODIS. Uh, when you upload something to CODIS, do you know what term he means by that, when he uses that term? We don't upload anything to CODIS. But do you know what the term means? To upload to CODIS? Yeah. To input a profile for searching? So like a known profile that's uploaded up to CODIS for other people to search against? Unknown or unknown profiles. But it's something that's saved and can be searched against? Yes. Are you familiar with other type of activity of CODIS? No, I'm not trained in CODIS, I'm not a CODIS admin. Um, again, our private lab does not have access to that. And if re CODIS was requested at the time of beginning of the process, does that delay the process? I, slightly, because we have to wait for approval from the CODIS lab. Um, so whatever lab they, that we get approval from, they have to have a chance to look at the submission paperwork and the case scenario to determine which profiles, if any, are developed um, that would be suitable for upload. Now, exhibits 1012, 1013, 1014, 1017, 1015, all the ones with the close-ups of the electroferrogram. Did you run those? Did I print those EPGs? Yeah. Uh, not the close-ups, no. Did you put the notes in there to say what all that stuff was? No. Is that anything product that you were involved in to develop? No. Do we know who did it? Uh, no, I'm not aware of who made those close-ups and reanalysis of that uh, raw data. You were told uh, by the defense, we don't want CODIS last May, right? Uh, let me check my email. On April 9th, 2018, they decided to forego the CODIS upload. Anything else? Yeah. Well, any questions for you? <laughs> Just one. Go ahead. What was the date in your report for your final The date in my report is June 18th, 2018. Over two months to get the report from the request. Yes. Um, no. All right. Uh, any objections, Mr. Ashley? Mr. Hughes? So, you can recall just in case, but I don't sure. the case. Thank you for your attendance, and uh, you are excused. Technically, you are still subject to the call, but I guess they can get a hold of you if we need it. Sure. Okay. <laughs> 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 If the pilot wants to turn around, you know. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, please make sure you don't kick any of the exhibits. You know, I'll, I'll come to And it's about, about 4.15, so we'll go ahead and <laughs> uh, evening recess at this time. Until so 9.30 uh, tomorrow morning. Again, keep in mind the admonitions previously given to you. If you want to form or express any opinions about the case, not to discuss the case or allow anyone to discuss the case with you or in your presence. Again, that means not discussing anything about the case. Any of the testimony, witnesses, exhibits, parties, or attorneys. 
and we'll see everyone back at 9.30 tomorrow.